Sam, thanks for coming. My pleasure. This is this is fun. Okay, so I we've talked about this before, but you are the scientist in residence. That's your official title at Lux Capital. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what that job means, um, and also a little bit about the advantages of being a, a scientist in a in a venture capital firm? I think that's an interesting place. Sure. To yeah. Yeah. So, and it's when, yeah. So, in terms of I mean, what scientists in residence means, it's basically my role. I mean, there are a number of people who have kind of different terms like that um, or like roles. It's not a very popular role or a very popular title, but um, I think it kind of means different things for each person. In terms of my own role, basically my job is to survey the landscape of science and technology and find areas that we at Luck should be involved with in some way. And then based on that, do a number of different things. Um, either find like, source deals, like find companies to invest in, uh, find people that we might want to actually build companies around because Lux builds companies from the ground up around like a group of scientists or an individual scientists and their work. Um, sometimes it's just simply engaging with the public through writing and speaking about the areas that I'm exploring. Uh, and sometimes it's, I guess, like downstream from investment, like connecting those areas uh, and the people that I've been um, finding to our portfolio of companies and saying like, guess what, CEO, like area X, which you might not even know exists, is actually really relevant to whatever you're doing. So a lot of what I'm doing, it's essentially um, like an import-export business of ideas and people. Uh, and, and kind of to like, to, to answer your, your second question, I and mean, one of the things I like about that role is, I and mean, oftentimes um, in science, I mean, there, I mean, there's many situations where it pays to be a specialist, but I think there's also many cases where it's good to be a little bit more, um, whether T-shaped or generalist or whatever it is, and having that role within a venture firm means that I really get to like double down on finding ways of connecting areas, finding areas that are underexplored in one domain, but are really well known in another way and kind of actually acting as a bridging role. Uh, and so, yeah, I find it enormously valuable. I get to um, explore a new idea, like I'm not even just every day, but like sometimes every hour, like in terms of like what, what it actually looks like, what I do. And a lot of my day is spent um, reading, talking to really interesting people, making connections, writing, um, just kind of like yeah, ex following my curiosity wherever it goes and finding ways of bringing those areas and the people that I find kind of into the Lux orbit, whether or not it's um, finding ways of investing in them, finding ways of kind of connecting those people to the, um, the Lux portfolio, the companies we've already invested in, um, but also just kind of trying to be aware of what these people are doing. I, I think a lot of, um, and a lot of venture firms don't want to don't want to kind of take a very like utilitarian or kind of um, tactical view of like connecting with people. But I think certainly at Lux, we kind of, we, we pride a certain amount of, amount of like randomness and optionality, like just trying to connect to interesting things that might be, that might not be relevant right now, but could be relevant down the line, like maybe years down the line. And I think that kind of my role is really just act as like some sort of optionality machine and find interesting things that we should be involved with in some way. And so, and so some of the things that I'm involved with might be just like helping someone work on some, like develop a research institution or kind of talk about some idea or maybe think through um, what they want to do after grad school. I, and some of the things are much more connected to some of the portfolio work, but like some of it can be very, very, very upstream to when Lux would um, actually be investing in something. Um, and the fact that I really have so much flexibility around that, uh, I, I, well, first of all, I feel very fortunate, but I think also kind of speaks to the idea that Lux recognizes that um, like the business of science and technology and innovation, like it's a very, it's a, it's a long game. And like, right. you really have to be in, like, involved in this and kind of invested in it in many, many different ways. Mm -hmm. It makes sense, yeah. I love it. I think it's really smart. I'm surprised more people don't do it. I think there's this, this kind of general thinking that there's science and there's technology and there's basic research and then there's um, applied research and that these are really hard, firm boundaries. And, and I don't know that that... Um, that that assumption is necessarily true. And I think the, the work that you do kind of proves the value of, of blending, blending some of those, those lines. I know when I, when I, at the end of last year, I kind of had this opportunity to step away from the day-to-day -day at SOFAR. And I was kind of looking around for my next opportunity. And I really wanted to try and find a, an entrepreneur in residence role, but at a lab. So mm -hmm. not... <laughs> not at a VC firm, you know, actually in, 
be an entrepreneur at in a scientific lab. And I actually kicked the tires on that a little bit. And I actually found it to be um, kind of hard to convince people of the value. So I think there's there's real rigid thinking about that. Um, how many other people or or companies uh, do you, do you think have roles like yours? I know you've you've told me about a list you're keeping. Yeah. So and so I don't know if and how many have like roles like mine. There, I think there's very few, if any, that have like roles kind of. Um, but there's definitely kind of like oddball outlier lo- roles, and I kind of use that like in the best possible way. Um, where I, I, people are experimenting with these things. And actually, you mentioned like with a lab. I a friend of mine. Um, he's a biologist at Stanford. Um, he actually had, this is a number of years ago, um, Richard Powers, the novelist, actually as like a writer in residence at one point. And like, but he was like, I don't think he wanted to like write. It was like, he wanted to actually just like pipette and like do the science and like in order to kind of really gain an appreciation for what was going on. And so I think there, there is, it depends on the organization. Um, I think an organization often has to be like a kind of a certain size to be willing to like try interesting, weird, ex- weird experiments. Um, but beyond that, there has to also just be a willingness to say, okay, like we want to bring in interesting people who are doing interesting things. And we don't really know exactly how it's going to be relevant, but that kind of willingness to experiment is, I think, really important. Um, so I've seen, I know I've seen someone with like a title writer in residence at a VC firm. Um, I've seen like data scientists in residence a couple of times. I think we've got chief scientists. Yeah. So I, I do have this spreadsheet with kind of a number of different, I think I found someone who has a title research partner. Um, mm. So yeah, so there's, there's a lot of really interesting roles, um, but it's, uh, and, and yeah, no, but it's, but, it, but it's fun. And, and I think it's, I mean, it definitely, like these, can, these things are the exception. Um, I think actually there was someone who was at Andreessen Horowitz at one point who was, I think it was like philosopher in residence. Um, so there's like mm. some really interesting attempts that have been made. Um, but I think it's like, you go in with the expectation, okay, this is going to be very much an experiment. We're going to see how it goes. We're going to see if like, it can kind of, if it, if it makes sense down the line. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there needs to be that willingness to actually try things out because otherwise, yeah, you end up in this kind of very rigid things of like, okay, like science is science, like technology is technology, venture is venture. And like, you don't really, have, and we, you need to have that cross pollination. And when you don't have that cross pollination, you're not going to be getting interesting, weird things happening. And so, um, yeah, it's unfortunate that there's not as many of these kinds of opportunities. You know, speaking of that, kind of blurring of the lines, you recently published um, the Overedge Catalog, which uh, brought together a lot of thinking and a lot of people that I had sort of been watching as well. Um, uh, can you talk about that? Can you talk about what you were saying? And can you talk about yeah. uh, where you think it's going? Sure, yeah. And so the way I kind of thought about this is, I mean, when, when people want to do research or innovate in a certain way, um, they often end up becoming attracted to like a certain relatively small set of organizational structures. And like you start a startup or you work in academia or you maybe join like a corporate industry lab um, or maybe you like join a philanthropy and help like support some of these things. But there's like a very narrow set of organizational structures and styles. Um, but the way I view that is though, like those are just points embedded in some like massively high dimensional space of potential organizations. And we need to actually innovate. Like we need to be thinking about, okay, what are all kind of the weird organizational structures that we could be trying out? And so um, there's a term that I discovered in cartography called overedges, which are like you have you have a map and then you have like the borders. But occasionally, when you're trying to make a map, there's like I don't know the edge of a mountain that doesn't quite fit. And so you kind of it actually like le- it, it leaks a little bit over the edge o- o- over the borders. And and those are called overedges. And I thought, okay, that's like a great term for these kinds of things. These organizations that are maybe a nonprofit, but with a little twist, or they're a for-profit, but they're maybe like some sort of um, public benefit organization, like a corporation, corporation, but they're also doing something else. So like, they don't quite fit into the kind of the traditional structures. And um, and over the past few years, I realized I've been exploring these kind of weird misfit organizations. And at a certain point, I realized like I need to just start like cataloging this and just putting it online. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I made this overage catalog. I put it online um, for a number of different reasons. One is I think some of these people who are building these organizations need to realize that like they're not alone. Like there are other organizations doing these things. I also wanted people to realize that many of these organizations, which on the surface seem pretty different because they might actually be have like they might be working in different domains. Some might be for profit, some might be nonprofit, um, some might be like more academic or library focused, some might be more tech, like tech startup-y. Um, they're all actually in some fundamental way kind of like playing 
in like they're, they're playing the same game, which in this case is trying to do really interesting, thoughtful research, but also stretching the boundaries of what's possible. And so I put this out there. Um, and, uh, and actually, and since like I began publicizing this on a couple months ago, um, and, uh, and we're, we're speaking right now at the, at the very end of May. Um, and, uh, and when I, um, and like, since I put it out there, like I know a lot of organizations, I, a number of people who run organizations have reached out to me and said, oh, you should, you should consider my organization. Or, um, or people have said, oh, you should try this other one. Or I've been able to kind of reach out to other organizations that I've discovered um, and just kind of learn more about what they're doing. And it's been enormously valuable just to kind of see that there really, there really does appear to be like a certain like pent up desire for some sort of community or recognition that like there is something interesting happening here. There is the fact that like we need to be exploring and innovating and not just in terms of like the kinds of research we're doing, but even like the organizational structures within which we're doing research. Um, the way I view it is, like, I, and for all I know, I, I certainly hope this is not true, but like there might be like within 10 years, like the vast majority of the things in the Overledge catalog, they might be defunct. Um, I wouldn't want that, but I also recognize that like there almost is this like Cambrian explosion right now of like people just trying so many different organizational structures. And to yeah. be honest, like, I don't really know which are gonna be the type that that actually thrive and like which ones find, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what the equivalent of like research structure for like not product market fit is, but like whatever, like ones that actually can like find a way to kind of continue to thrive. Um, but I just want there to be so many of these different kinds of things because I think we need more. Like, like we are so stuck in the traditional organizational modes that we need to be trying new things. Yeah, definitely. It feels very zeitgeisty in the sense that um, I think a lot of people are finding that that kind of common denominator. And, you know, I was excited that you included the Experiment Foundation on there, but it doesn't surprise me to hear that people have reached out and say, hey, can you include my, I think there's a real kind of desire to, to find that connection. It reminds me of the early days of um, the, the maker movement, which was my last kind of time that I was caught up in an amateur wave of, of people trying things for, for more than just profit. There was a real sense of kind of idealism there. Um, now I wanna ask, I wanna push a little bit more on that because I right. think from your perspective, you have been in this world for a long time, right? Like you were in the, the Scientometrics kind of scene, you've been kind of tracking the, the, the fringes of academia and, mm -hmm. and knowledge. And you've also been talking to a lot of these folks too and kind of you know having conversations. Um, what are your, some of your predictions for what we'll learn in the next few years from, from all of these tests and experiments? Um, what do you, what's your, what's your hunch on what'll shake out and, and how this will, this will play out? Oh, I, and that's a good question. And I'm not sure, and I have to kind of think about this and it might be like, as in the, in the talking, I'll, I'll think it through, sure. but I'm not really sure I currently have any like clear predictions. I mean, when you mentioned like, like the open science and like the science metric community and things like that. Um, yeah, obviously people are kind of, have been thinking a lot about how to rethink science and how to rethink research. Um, I do think though that there's been a certain shift of like, like maybe like, I don't know, like the first generation of this kind of thing, I mean, maybe it was like the second or third generation, but like the most, the, the previous iteration was all, was focused a lot around um, new ways of measuring scientific contribution, like whether it was um, around kind of like alt metrics or um, new ways of scientific publication or new tools for collaboration. And those were all I mean, enormously valuable, but I think this newer kind of stage feels like, feels that there's a recognition that it's not enough to just rethink how we're doing, like how we're kind of presenting our research or how we're doing our research, but also like the organizational structure is going, is, is very, um, it, it really determines the kinds of things you can actually do. So like, it, it, there's kind of a recognition of, okay, even if we tweak how science is, like how scientific research is published or how, um, how we share data and things like that, if we're still doing that within the academy, for example, um, there's only so far we can kind of stretch things and we need to actually create new types of organizations. And so my guess is, and so my prediction, well, I would say one, one simple prediction is, universities are still gonna be here. Like, like, like that's not gonna change. Um, but I do think there is going to be a recognition that um, in the same, like that, and so there's a paper by um, Jason Prem, this is maybe like now a decade ago or so, about like um, kind of the different roles that a scientific journal actually has. Like where it's it's not just like publishing papers, it's it disseminating research, it's kind of, it's like, like 
Um, there's like a seal of approval. If there's kind of like a peer review role. There's all these different roles that a scientific journal kind of all bundles together. And I feel like a university also does the same thing. There's a lot of different things that a university is doing. Um, only some of which actually involve research. Um, and only a subset of those of those aspects of research are um, like kind of, I, I guess, um, being ported over to some of these other organizations. And so the way I view it is, um, the way I view like science more broadly, or let's just say innovation, but like certainly within science, like there is a, um, there's a large slew of activities that are valuable for science. Um, unfortunately, only a small subset of those are actually valued by like scientific academia. And by that, I mean like the things that get you tenure, like they're, they're like, like there, there are a certain set of things that get you tenure. And those are a subset of all the different things that actually are really valuable for contributing to science. And I think um, what I would like to see is that these kind of organizations, that some of them will be devoted not just to being able to kind of like hold their own against scientific, like scientific academia, of like, oh, like, look at this, like, here's an independent research group that is like doing like top notch research that can like, that is as highly cited as things in academia. Like, that's great. But I actually think like some of these organizations should realize they need to actually be playing an entirely different game. And so the way I kind of think about this is, I can't remember if I mentioned this, this, um, this story to you before, but there was, a, there was a paper, maybe it's like 10, 15 years ago or so, um, and it, it looked at the immunology literature over the course of like 50 years or so. Mm -hmm. And um, he, the, the person who looked at it was looking at the literature, looking at like scientists who were highly cited, um, but he also looked at re, not just the number of citations, but actually the number of times that various researchers were acknowledged at the end of the paper, like in, in someone else's acknowledgements. Mm -hmm. And so he, and, and one of the groups he specifically looked at were into researchers who were um, had a relatively mediocre number of citations, but were actually highly acknowledged. And he found that when those researchers died, the, the productivity of all the people they had been collaborating with actually dropped. And so it showed that these people who like maybe like by the traditional metrics of like citation and influence in papers were not actually that important, were being undervalued. Like they were actually enormously valuable for the scientific endeavor. And, and, and I think, and the solution is not therefore to say, oh, therefore like we need to like start counting acknowledgements in your tenure package. I think like that kind of thing can be easily gained. Like that's not the right solution, but the thing, the thing is to recognize that there's a whole other set of activities that are valuable for science. And we can, and if we can find ways of like having an organizational home for those kinds of things, or even just individuals who play a different sort of game within academia or within large, more traditional um, research institutes, I think that'd be really important. I think another thing um, that I think would be really interesting to see and potentially these kinds of organizations can do is to recognize that, I, mean, I think many people who are kind of outside of science think of like, oh, like you're a scientist, you're kind of in the ivory tower, you therefore have the luxury to think about all these ideas, there's no time pressures, but of course like science, like it's not extremely long-term. Um, like you, you, you operate on the, like on the life, like lifetime of a grant and, uh, or like lifetime of like trying to get tenure and you don't necessarily have the opportunity to do relatively long-term research projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, I, and there are exceptions. There's what, like the pitch drop experiment, but like, the only, like, like where like, they're like monitoring some piece of pitch and like whether or not it drops and like, and the reason that can survive is like, it's just kind of like in a corner of some guy's lab and like, it just kind of is there and like, it, it is what it is. Um, yeah. but but I think there's a need for um, engaging in like really like long-term thinking within science and even technological progress and potentially some of these kinds of organizations um, allow for some of that game to be played. Um, and so I, so I think it's exciting. I, I realize now I've talked for a while, but I've not made any concrete predictions, but I think, but I would say my hope rather than my prediction is that these kinds of organizations will hopefully allow for there to be a space for um, new, like like a broader space of scientific contribution, like people like recognizing like that there's a lot of other things that are really important for science um, yeah. outside of just kind of the traditional scientific like publication role, um, as well as maybe some like longer term kind of um, outputs as well. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, you know, I interviewed Annalie Newitz, and they told me. Um, something interesting, which is that science is designed to move slowly. And a lot of us who are in tech kind of expect things to change quickly. And a lot of us who build companies expect mm -hmm. things to change quickly because those cycles are pretty fast. Science is really designed to move slowly. And I think you know, I was going back and rereading um, 
Michael Nielsen's Reinventing Discovery and some of the stuff Kevin Kelly was writing about how science is going to change more in the next five years or 10 years than the you know, past hundred. And I think those, all of those ingredients that, that they've been talking about and you've been talking about and we've been talking about are there. And I think it's happening slowly. I think this change is going to be a, a generational one. And I've, but I've also been thinking about, um, there are a couple of places where I think things have really changed in science. And one of those I think is in science communication. So, mm -hmm. you know, a generation ago, you know, 20 years ago, you know, whatever, Carl Sagan was, you know, on TV talking about, um, you know, the cosmos and, and had, a, had a different way of communicating science than was popular at the time and was really criticized, almost vilified for that. It was called Saganization. And um, you look at the, the generation of scientists who are coming up now, um, science communication, being on social media, talking about uh, their work, it's, it's no longer uh, stigmatized. I think it's, it's expected, it's encouraged, and people are carving out alternative kind of livelihoods beyond tenure uh, in that world. And so I think there are places outside of the, the, the paper mill, like the, the publishing papers and, and you know, getting citations and getting tenure that are actually moving faster. And so I'm watching those spaces a little bit closer. I think like scientists becoming founders is another positive uh, trend. I mean, Ginkgo just went public, I don't know, yeah. this, this month. And those are, you know, those were actual scientists who started that company and built the company and are still the CEOs. I think that's a really positive trend. Anyways, so I'm looking out, I'm looking at the incentive systems that are outside of the paper uh, to be the ones that are going to change things the fastest. And so that got me thinking along, you know, what uh, potential alternative, you know, almost alternative assets uh, could draw, could continue to drive that change. So um, I don't know, have you thought about uh, incentive systems and the ways that those, what we could develop there that might be interesting? Well, I mean, sir, I, mean I like, I like, I like your focus on like kind of scientists moving to becoming founders as well as like the science communication. And I think the fact that we, I mean, I, I don't think we were ever like bad at rewarding those, although maybe the science communication, but like we now, yeah, like there's now the fact that like these things are incentivized to a certain degree that it creates a broader space for people to do those kinds of things. Um, I think, yeah, so I would say like those are actually really interesting um, trends. And I think, and actually one of the things that I, that I think about in terms of like the science communication is also just even more broadly, like recognizing that like a sort of like synthetic role of like saying, okay, I'm not like, I might be combining scientific ideas in a novel way. And like that in and of itself, like, like, and then communicating, either communicating to the, to the public or then using that as a way of, um, yeah, building a company and actually related to that in terms of incentive. Um, and I mentioned kind of like, kind of like more like generalist thinking. I actually think that generalist thinking might be like it is now being incentivized um, in terms of like actually being a like, like I mean, obviously specialization can be good. It's very powerful. <laughs> you learn a lot about a certain thing. It's it, it's very it's very valuable. But if you are able to let's say speak the language of like three different domains, and very few people cannot like are able to do that, that not only makes you valuable, but like you can, if you can combine those areas in a certain novel way and potentially even like turn it into a company, like. That's like a defensible thing. Like, if, like if you're the only one who kind of can combine, um, I don't know, like biochemistry and I don't know some weird thing from applied mathematics and something else from um, I don't know, I don't even know, like data, like data science. Like, who knows? I'm not I'm making something up. Like, and you're the only one who can do that. Like, that is um, it's enormously valuable because like then you might actually be able to build a company around that, or you might be able to talk about that kind of thing, like communicate to the public of like, guess what? Like, combining these two different areas or three different areas actually leads me to understand something around certain trends that are happening. And so then you can then become an expert on those things, um, even though you might not actually be like the expert on any individual one of those things, but you're able to kind of speak those languages. And so I think, um, I'm not sure this is quite the answer to what you're going about, but like certain things around like overcoming jargon barriers um, or uh, yeah, or like finding ways of kind of connecting areas that are often kind of disparate. Um, 
I think we're now having better ways of incentivizing those kinds of things, which is shaking up a certain amount of how science is done. Um, but at the same time, though, I agree that like scientific change, like well, the, the not necessarily scientific change, but like the like how scientists do what they do, how that changes, um, that's slow. But I but I do think I mean, but we have to also distinguish between like slow change versus like cumulative change. Like if something's incremental but it accumulates, like then. We just need to be patient and like it's like the same way of like i don't know, like like um like exponential growth and compound interest like these things add up and so i think that and going back to what you're saying of like a generational change like these kinds of things can be enormously valuable and oftentimes like we often like discount like if we don't see the change happening really rapidly um oftentimes we don't realize how like how much like change actually truly occurs and like and i, and I think about this like, so much um so my grandfather, and he lived to the age of 99. He read science fiction since like, I guess like the modern dawn of the genre. He like read it like basically his entire life. And, um, and like I, and he read, I think he read Dune when it was like serialized in a magazine. Um, and so he, and I remember when, when the iPhone came out, um, I went with my grandfather and my father to the Apple store and he was like playing with the phone. He's like, this is it. Like, he's like, this is the object I've been reading about for all these years. It's real. And then of course, like within a few years, everyone's just like, why doesn't it do this other thing? Why does it suck so bad? And like, like we are very good at like adapting but we also have to realize in, in that case that was to a certain degree that was very much more like some sort of step change um but in many other ways like most scientific and technological change is slow but it's steady and then only what kind of in hindsight do we realize oh wow we have come a really really long way and things have changed but but it often it needs to be cumulative there happen there have to be people sometimes who are like actually interested in making sure that is a directional shift as opposed to just kind of some random walk that kind of ends up in a way it's somewhere it will end up somewhere not necessarily where we want to go so um yeah so i think there's and yeah so I have incentives in terms of like making sure those accumulated changes actually add up towards some goal are, are really important but uh um but yeah but i i am i am not against incremental change at all i actually think like that that we kind of often undervalue slow steady incremental change I and mean, i i'm also affiliated with the long now foundation so i think a lot about in terms of like really long term like long-term change. And I think that we, um, yeah, just like as a society are often like unable to kind of, to necessarily think about that. I, I do think one of the reasons why though things can change more rapidly in shorter periods of time, especially in terms of scientific progress is just simply the fact that there are more scientists than there have ever been before. And so mm -hmm. like, it's just a simple like game of numbers. And like, if everyone's like, if all of the research is building upon whatever came before it, then we're just going to keep on making more and more and more. And in many cases, that's extremely overwhelming. And like, and you can't navigate all the science that's out there. And there's a lot of other issues there in terms of like, actually like uncovering hidden knowledge and find, there's a lot of other opportunities, yeah. but, but there's just, but yeah, as more people play this game of science, there's just more, like more is going to be generated and it's going to happen faster and faster and accelerates. So you, you mentioned a few things. One is you're affiliated with the long now, um, you mentioned this idea of being a generalist as important to, to maybe connecting those dots. I would, and I've heard you talk about generalist thinking before, I would actually push that further and say, something I admire about you is I think you're actually a tangentialist where it's not that you just know about things, you know, just like you dropped that you're affiliated with along now and you're, you're you know, helping them think through some of the really interesting challenges that they're thinking about. Um, you're actually involved in it. And you have this unique ability to be tangentially involved with a lot of interesting things. So it's not just knowing about them and not knowing the language, it's actually figuring out a way to be helpful and useful. And um, you know, maybe not necessarily being the center of those, those movements, but having a really healthy pulse, uh, you know, finger on the pulse and, um, and nudging them along. And I think that is really underrated and really important. And I also think it's a fun way to live. Um, and so I, I, and, and I admire that in you. So my, my, my question is, what advice do you give people to, to build more of that tangentialism into their lives? What, what kind of tips or tricks are there for, oh, for doing more of that? And I mean, certainly, I mean, I mean, a lot of it is just like my curiosity, like kind of wherever my curiosity takes me. But I think, um, it's been helped a lot by like my, like I do a lot of writing and like writing in public to a certain degree helps, well, one, just like 
causes me to actually make sure my ideas are really thought through. Like kind of the, the, the process of writing things down, like going back and forth with an editor, figuring things out, sharing it with other people um, and getting feedback. That is, um, it, it like hones ideas like or topics that I'm exploring, but it also can then act to a certain degree as like a calling card of like, oh, like I'm not just like, interested in some topic, but I also happen to be like, I, I have thought about it in some way, in some serious way, and like, I published it somewhere or whatever it is. Um, and so I think, uh, and this, it's, this sounds kind of like trivial, but like, like one should not underestimate the power of like writing in public and sharing your ideas um, because that is a way of like helping build community. I mean, like, I, so for example, I'm like with the Overedge catalog, and I've been thinking about a lot of these kinds of things for a long time, but um, it was really with like, actually putting the Overedge catalog online and kind of beginning to share it, that then it kind of not only, um, like, I guess, raised awareness for some of these things, but also then like caused people to like reach out to me about certain about, about the, the, this kind of idea. And so I think um, really sharing this kind of stuff as well as like taking some topic, but then trying to add even a little bit of your own through writing or kind of just sharing some project, um, that really, um, like, yeah, then it kind of makes it like, oh, like you're actually, you played a little bit, at least in this other topic, in this other area. And then you can kind of at least um, use that as like a way of like, like opening the door a little bit and you're like, oh, like, can I come play in whatever topic, whatever area you're playing in? And, uh, and then, and then I'm sorry, like view me as like, oh, I'm not like necessarily like the person who's like been playing in this for like decades or whatever. And, and I'm very cognizant of many of these topics, like many areas that, that I'm, that I'm involved with. Um, there are many more people who are um, like more deeply expert in these things. Um, but I think often like my value is like, I can kind of like play in lots of different areas um, in some legitimate way. And so the fact that I can like not, yeah, not only just like speak the jargon, but like help translate things or kind of bring ideas from one to one community to another, um, that's very valuable. Um, and so that, right. I, I, at least in my, I, it's also just, it is a lot of fun. I agree with you that like getting to like think about like long-term thinking or the future of organizations or, um, uh, I wrote a piece in uh, for Wired a few months back about like um, kind of like revisiting old technologies and thinking about old like technological history and stuff like that. Like that has also given me the opportunity to talk to people in like technological history spaces. Um, and oh, well, I guess I, my my second book also dealt with a lot of technological history. But that um, yeah, like th those things have just allowed me to kind of talk to so many different people, and it's been enormously valuable and just a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, I it's one thing I've noticed that. Um a lot of the people that I really admire, a lot of the, the thinkers and doers and entrepreneurs that I really admire have that same quality that they just, you know, it's like the Stuart Brand kind of thing, just showing up at the most interesting well, times. He is, another, he is a totally different no, level. I would of never. Of course, he's <laughs> on the Mount Rushmore of that for sure. Yeah. But, it's, but uh, uh, it's a useful skill. Um, okay, cool. Well, I, I, I've, I've got other questions along those lines, but I don't know if that's a good time to jump to the the kind of research mode, I don't know if you have anything. Uh, yeah, to show. And, and, and we can do more questions, but I'm happy to also do kind of like yeah, yeah. mode stuff. So I mean, and for, I can tell you kind of like, and first, and before I kind of like begin sharing things, I can just yeah. I mention I I um and I have a lot of print books. I actually yeah. use books. I, my my research system. I it's very technological, but I also do a lot of like kind of print things. And so um so like for example, I, I think actually one of my one of my colleagues was like shocked when I was like, oh, I have to like go, go back and like find my notes when I discuss someone. But like, yeah, when I, when I meet with people almost, almost every meeting, like I keep it in these like little notebooks, um, those are kind yeah. of little graph rule notebooks. Um, but, and then at this point, I, they're all like dated. I have, I don't know, I have a whole, whole stack of them downstairs in the basement. And then yeah. this one is, I've been using this one, I guess, since um, the end of February. Um, I would say that the downside is I, it is not searchable at all. And sometimes I have trouble finding things and like, I have to like, look, I usually like look through my, like my Google calendar to figure out, okay, when did I talk to this person? And then I go and like, look at, and like look in the notebook and find stuff. Um, but I do think to a certain degree that like the actual act of like writing some stuff down helps me, like it actually just helps store it in my brain. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I just kind of like that. It also, I think gives me something to do while talking to people it's like a very I, otherwise i'm probably just gonna get super distracted and so like that is that is important for me too um so i definitely do that um and i read a lot of my books in like in, in print um the, and, and i have to say in terms of like reading books in print um for me and i think many people like talk about like oh, like it's wonderful like the feel of the book and like yeah i'm sure like i'm not like immune to like 
kind of like the aesthetic and like emotional connections. I view it also though as, um, I guess a few different things. One is um, most like for, for, for um, nonfiction books, I read a lot of them um, fairly non-linearly and it's just harder to do that in like mm -hmm. an ebook format. And so like if I'm jumping around, it's a lot easier to do that in a print book. Um, in addition, I also view it as like they are, I don't, know, I don't know if like backwards compatible is the right term, but like they certainly like, like if I take a book, like if I put a book on my shelf and I take it off like 20 years later, I know that book is going to load. Like I just open it up and I can read it, but like there's not necessarily the same level of certainty with books um, in uh, like, yeah, like an ebook. Like it maybe like uh, Kindle has some weird rights, like some permission problems or whatever it is, or like my Kindle no longer works or whatever. And so I like the idea of like, okay, I know these books, they will actually, they will, they will operate um, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in, uh, many decades hence or whatever. And so, yeah, I, and when I, when I, um, looking at books and so here's a couple, I, I use these little sticky things for, um, to kind of keep track of stuff. I write in them, underline them. And so it's a, they're kind of a mess. Um, but then it's also great because then I can, like, when I'm looking at books, I can like easily find the different things that I thought were interesting. Um, yeah. actually what, and related to that, one of the things that I have built, and I guess I can, well, I guess I can show you an example email of it. I think I found one. Um, so one of the things I'm really into is building tools for serendipity. Um, I like, because I think at least this is the, the way my brain operates and you kind of alluded to this with like kind of like a tangentialism. Like I like connecting things together that are not always connected. And so I built, I built a lot of kind of like my own like jury rig, like software tools to allow me to kind of um, jumpstart that process. And so like, for example, one thing I did that um, this is like years ago now. So the, the data that is kind of out of date, but I, um, I think there was it's like an app called like Libib where you can use your um, use your phone like use the camera and like just scan the barcodes on all your books and it will just like upload them and, I, and then I just took that took that exported as a CSV and then I built a little script that every Monday morning it sends me like a random selection of five books that I should revisit because the truth is whenever I get a book I often get it for a specific reason and like I'm looking at it with a certain lens and with certain eyes um, but then of course my interests change and so. Um, it kind of forces me to like at least like consider revisiting those books. I would say the vast majority of the time when I get the like the collection of like the five books to look at, I'm just like, yeah, this is not. I don't actually want to look at them. But occasionally, I'm like, oh, this is one that maybe is worthwhile taking a look at. So I, I can, I guess, can share an example. Um, cool. So yeah, so books to search. So this is a, like you can see like okay, here's like five, so this is I guess from like the end of April. So like, here's one like oh, yeah, writing creative nonfiction. Here's like <laughs> the Iliad. The Phenomenon of Man, um, Science Since Babylon by Derek DeSola Price, and then like some book about like strategies for writing. Um, so it just kind of like sends me like little uh, little snapshot of like what the people are um, like, or like a little thumbnail of the book. And then I can decide, do I want to re-examine this or not? Um, which is a lot of fun. And then I've also built, so so I, I guess if we want to like look at like other like tools for kind of thinking about this kind of stuff. So yeah. I, I built that one. I built another thing called Blink Microscope. Can you see that? Um, yeah. So, like, welcome to so this, I know mean, it's very, and I think there's a way of like, you can like request access to it. It's, I would not recommend anyone request access to it. As, as I mentioned <laughs> at the bottom, probably made with spaghetti code. It's kind of a mess, but what this one did, the, the, basically behind this, I kind of view it as here's like the about, you can kind of see a little bit more about it, but it's like, it's like um, Google alerts on steroids, but like using RSS feeds. And the idea is like, there is a number of RSS feeds or, and I subscribe to like a million RSS feeds, like a lot of blogs, like that's where I get a lot of my information, but there are certain RSS feeds that are just like fire hoses. Like, I don't know, like the RSS feed for like the bio archive or like certain topics on the archive, like you can't go right. through all of them, but you might want to filter them and find interesting things. Yeah. So I made this little tool where you can just kind of create a whole bunch of like search, like search terms and like ways of saying, okay, I want to look at this this RSS feed, but only, but only show me things when like X comes up or Y comes up. And so you can see, so, and then it'll just send me an email, like once a day, once a day maximum of like, like anything that it finds. Um, I think it's actually not working so well. It only comes up, like, it only emails me like once a week or so, but like an example of one of these would be, um, here, let me see if I can find it. Um, so here's, I'll put this, okay. So like, here's like blink microscope results. So you can see like, okay, this one, apparently I was looking for things in the bio archive that have the term fractal or chaos. Um, because not many people write bio articles using fractals or chaos. And it came up with this paper about climate change and the complex dynamics of green spruce, aphid spruce, plantation interactions. Like, I, I looked at the, the abstract and I was like, okay, this is not actually interesting, but like, occasionally I'll come up with things, like just weird things. And like, so I, I've tried to build a lot of these. And actually one of the other things I, well, I used to use, um, there was a tool called Nuzzle. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah, um, it was, it, it was, it, it actually just, it, like, I think it was acquired by some other, I think it was acquired by Twitter and then like, 
was discontinued. So I was actually glad I stopped using it. But the premise behind Nuzzle is rather than drinking from the fire hose of Twitter, just um, like if you're interested in simply the most popular like tweeted articles by the people you follow, it'll just show you that. And one of the things I discovered oh. with that was it can just do it. You can actually build a news. They have a newsletter function where it'll just send you one email every morning of like the, the top five or six links that you're that you the people you follow have shared and i was like this is great and like and i actually at a certain point stopped using twitter actively and i'm like this is my that was like my main way i consumed it and um but at a certain point i realized it wasn't giving me the kind of things i wanted and so i actually built using um so i don't there's this website called wayscript um okay. and so it's actually, it's actually a company that lux is an investor in um and it's this tool it's a way of like very easily kind of building tools to kind of connect things. And so I think there's like Zapier and things like that. This is like, take that, but like on steroids. And so one mm. of the things that I was able to do was I, um, I, I, I created this little program that uh, takes a list of like, I don't know, 25, 30 people on Twitter that I think actually just happened to tweet at a high rate, like you know, really interesting articles and links. And then what I did was I built some little Python script that I put into Wayscript because you can actually build Python scripts within it. And, um, and, I, and I had it send me, and I, I built it to send me like a daily email of like, here's the link. And I can actually sh show you an example of one of them. Um, so let me, so you can kind of, uh, actually, did I just close one? Um, I closed here, let me, let me open one. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, here's one, here it is. Oh, it's, it was just on, all right. So here you can see surface links. Cause like I have a little whale there. Um, and you can see like, oh, so like, like here's some like drive GAN, here's something from like, Paul Kodrowski, this is the health stuff. And you can see like, it gives you like the title of the article, the actual link to it, as well as the link on Twitter. So you can kind of get a little bit of context of why this thing was, was being shared. And then it just sends me this like every morning. Um, well, actually this one, it says 10, 20 a.m. That might've been like, cause I was doing some debugging. Usually it's like eight in the morning. It sends me something. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and it's great. And like, I, I, so I just kind of like tried to build a whole bunch of like little tools to kind of make it more likely that I can find interesting things. Um, it also happens to be, and so I curate this um, newsletter for for Lux called Lux Recommends, where it's like the things that people are like reading or consuming, if it's like media or whatever, um, from like the Lux team. And so we send it out every Friday. And it's great. Uh, and yeah, so, I like it. Oh, well, thank you. And so because of that, like I, I all like the Lux team just like shares tons of either like emails me or like we we share it on Slack. And so I just get to like see this like fire hose of like the interesting things that the folks at, at Lux are thinking about, which is great. Um, so yeah, so, so that's kind of like, I, mean, I guess that's the like very um, rough uh, kind of like initial process of like just kind of like gathering lots and lots of information. Um, in terms of like other like other parts of my research process. And so I definitely, I use, and I know um, like Ben Reinhardt, I, I think he, he was, he was, he chatted with you on this mm -hmm. and he actually, he was the one who convinced me to use um, Bear as the app, uh, like, yep. Bear, like, like the note making app. Um, I, at one, he was also telling me about like Zettelkast and all like that whole stuff. I tried it for a little while. It got to be kind of a little too um, intensive, but it was just, a, it, it was like a little too much for me, but I still end yeah. up using Bear. And I, right now I just use Bear. And the one I think with Bear, unlike Rome or like, it's bi, like Rome has bi-directional links, Bear only has one directional links, but it's like a nice little um, environment where I, I, I have, I'll have a note around some topic, I throw mm -hmm. everything in that I want there. If it gets too overwhelming, I take certain subsections, make them a new note, then I can easily link to that note. And I can kind of just go, and it also search wise, it's very fast and very easy for like key terms. And so you can kind of just go through and, and find it. And, and so, um, yeah, so I would say like for, I uh, use Bear as like my note taking app in terms of like keeping track of projects. I've actually just recently started using um, Trello, um, hmm. which I guess, and it was just more for like businesses, but it's like just a good way of kind of like seeing at a glance, all the different projects I'm working on and like which ones are kind of in the background, which ones I should be actually actively thinking about. And because yeah. right now, because oftentimes I'll have like a million different projects and I will forget about them, like certain ones until something else happens. And so now I can like have a column like, okay, ones I'm waiting to hear back on, ones that I um, want to think about, but maybe like they won't become active for like another month or so. And other ones that are like extremely in the background. So like the one of like, like the spreadsheet of like weird VC roles that I'm thinking about, that's like one like very much in the background. Like when I, when something comes across, like when I, was something comes across, I will like add it to that, but like, I'm not like actively working on that project really. Yeah, um, and then yeah. like other products that are kind of like done, but not really, but I, I kind of keep them in another column as well. So that's, um, uh, so that I would use, so I use that. And then um, like for writing, I use um, Scrivener. I don't know if other people have shared that, like Scrivener is yeah. an amazing tool. Um, and, 
and uh, I guess I plus I, I I don't actually use Word anymore. I've started using LibreOffice um, just okay. because it was like it just it's the same thing, but it's just kind of free um, an open source. Um, I'm trying to give other tools and things. But let me see if I can. How do you get feedback? Like if you're thinking about a night, what's your what's oh. your what's your you know your you've got half an essay written or you're, oh, you're okay. halfway through an idea and you need, what's your, what's that process like for you? So that process, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, so when, when it's, so I would say I actually, so, well, I'll take a step back and I'll answer that. But like one of the, sure. the way in which I kind of like often explore a new topic is I kind of like the, the search method I use is like expert search. Um, I basically like try to find someone who like knows a lot about it. And then like, I talk to them and they tell me who else to talk to. And then I kind of use that to like navigate this like, like some sort of like implicit web or like the network of people. Um, and I feel like this, like that's the same kind of thing with like, depending on the topic, um, like if it's at a very early stage, I'll yeah, just start reaching out to experts and talking to them of like, okay, like how should I be thinking about this? Um, and uh, like, sorry, what, there was one topic I was thinking about related to like neuroscience and like digital therapeutics. And, um, and initially the conversations were like, okay, like can I have a conversation without people like laughing me out of the room? If I could do that, then I kind of go to the next stage and I begin honing it and kind of going from there. And so, so yeah, so it really kind of depends on the topic that I'm kind of using to, to get feedback. But like I, with the Overage catalog, before I kind of began sharing it publicly, I'd actually shared it with a number of different people um, in terms, like, which gave me a lot of feedback about like which kind of like obvious organizations I was just missing, um, as well as like the kind of like other, so like here, like here's the Overage catalog. You can see like, like at the bottom, I also just include a whole bunch of like, resources and like like pointers and so um a lot wow, of people that, have that has gotten much longer since i looked oh at yeah last so, week. yeah i don't know if it's gotten that much longer but i, I try i keep on trying to add more things i have like a little thing of like saying like when it was last up so i say okay the catalog it's now is as of may 13th so i i guess i updated it like a, a few weeks ago um but yeah i keep on um yeah I, i've been adding a whole bunch um I, it's getting to the point where it's getting a little unwieldy and uh, and i yeah. my most recent like i also have like a personal newsletter where I kind of share some things. And in my most recent newsletter, I actually asked, um, like, does anyone have suggestions like when it becomes like unwieldy? Like, what do I do? Like, should I start curating it more heavily? Should I kind of like build a whole site where there's like multiple different pages? Um, the truth is I'm not sure. Um, no one actually responded to my to my plea, um, but, but but who knows? But, I, but I'm still kind of thinking about like what to do kind of long-term with it. But uh, it's, um, yeah. But yeah, so like, but, like, in terms of like the further resources, like I, people gave me some really, like some interesting suggestions here and things like that. I think as well we'll as look back. At, I think we'll look at this as like you know, regardless of what this turns into, I think this will be um, the first time that someone put a flag in the ground for whatever whatever it is that's a, that's happening. This zeitgeist. Um, I, I think. <laughs> Thank this, you. I mean, I mean, there are other people who have done things around. So like, I know like. And so actually, no I, I, about I, yeah, like Ben Reinhardt, he has a running list of interesting organizational structures. Um, Matt Webb, he so here I'm, he, he like did this like orthogonal technology lab idea, and he actually compiled a list of some like organizations. And, like there's a decent amount of overlap. Um, I think like we're, I, the truth is like a lot of like a lot of people are all kind of like converging on this idea, um, which is um, which is really exciting. Like I I, I think like there, there's something like yeah there's there's something going on here, which is which is great. Oh, for sure. I I I feel it all the time. I mean, that's why I kind of started this interview series is to is to make some of those connections, you know, and just kind yeah, of have yeah. the discussions with people because I think we're all kind of feeling around um, in in the dark a little bit. We all sense that there's something really exciting that's um, that's possible. You know, one thing I this is a little bit of a jump, but I was I you know in rereading your books over the past few days, I was thinking about the half-life of facts and, you know, in there, you, I think, you know, I read it many years ago. I don't know when I first read it, maybe when it, around when it came out. And um, I remember that being, uh, it, it, it kind of woke me up at the time. It was like, oh, wow, this is a really interesting way to think about knowledge, that it's not a static thing, that it's something that is very dynamic. You know, it's like almost like, you know, Stuart Brand's How Buildings Learns, like buildings change through time. And, you know, this was mm -hmm. like how knowledge changes through time. And and um, in many ways is kind of a predecessor to a lot of the the thinking that's going on in a lot of the Overage catalog folks' minds. Anyways, um, one thing that it didn't predict, or it did, but in a way, I think 
is this the rise of misinformation and um, and all of that? Where do you stand like now on you know the 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 nature of truth given all we've seen in the past few years with with fake news and misinformation campaigns? Yeah, I, that's a good point. And so when yeah, I guess when I wrote the book, I was thinking like I was much more focused on like how can we kind of um, like root out error and like when I thought about like si within the context of science it and like knowledge I guess but like especially like scientific knowledge it was much more around the sense of like okay like I mean the vast majority of people they're not malicious but at the same time like scientists are all humans and like we make mistakes everything's imperfect and it kind of takes time to kind of root out error and kind of but like science is like a self-correcting enterprise and so mm -hmm. I was definitely in this um, kind of like recognizing like okay the inherent like humanity of science but also this like kind of the perfectibility of, of, of the endeavor. Um, now, um, I'm not sure if I've totally changed my position. I think I certainly like underestimate, <laughs> underestimated the malicious component of like, okay, there are actually a lot of people who are doing these things. And the fact that like we have these online tools that are kind of allow us to um, uh, like amplify a lot of that has really kind of changed things. And um, it's not just a matter of like rooting out error and like searching for the best thing. It's like when there's just so much garbage out there that's like actively wrong, um, not just like, like like passively wrong or kind of like regrettably wrong, um, but it's like actively trying to out, like out to like muddy the waters. Um, it just makes that search process so much more difficult. So yeah, and I guess I, I certainly like, I, I, not, I definitely was not thinking about that kind of thing at all when I wrote the book. Um, I, I still think that at least when it comes to science, um, like the scientific process, I, like, cause when I think about science, like, I don't think about science as just like a body of knowledge. I think about it as this, like, it's like a process of like rigorously querying the world. Um, mm -hmm. And so like, I still think that, like, I still believe in that process. Um, yeah. and, and, and I think as a self-correcting enterprise, I think it's actually really good. And so in some ways, I wonder if I could, I haven't really thought this through or kind of really sure what this what this would mean, but almost like the fact that science is able to kind of self-correct and kind of yeah. get things right eventually. And like actually one of the things I, I also underestimated in the book was like um like like things around reproducibility. I, I I kind of I think I noted that like no one like people aren't gonna get credit for reproducing stuff, but like we have now since found ways of incentivizing that, which is great. And so so that's really good. But at the same time though, so I wonder if there's ways of like almost like exporting the process of science to kind of the way in which we just create and disseminate knowledge more broadly, um, yeah. if that could be useful. I don't know what that would exactly mean, but I really think that that potentially using ideas from science, um, like in the way like in the way that science is done, could yeah. help reduce misinformation. Um, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah. yeah. I, no, I'm I'm with you. I, I I just think it's um because I I'm like you in that in all these situations, I'm just looking at what's most exciting. But I've also, I, I, I kind of feel a sense of responsibility, especially in this kind of science letter, to do a better job incorporating all the folks who are actually working on, on that other boundary. Because, you know, I think we're looking at like specifically at how do we get more better good ideas, like that yeah. boundary of how science is changing. But I think there's a, another set of folks who are actually really thinking in interesting ways about science's role in society. And the and you know the citizen science movement started to to scratch at this, um, you know I think they've kind of gone really inward looking, you know. But anyways, it's a whole other thing. Just kind of rethinking the those interfaces. And I think the yeah. question you just asked of what you know, what what can we export um, is really so, so, interesting. Yeah, ahead. I was gonna say so one thing that I'm thinking, and I wonder if it's like, I wonder if the thing we can export is the right balance of like certainty to uncertainty. Cause like when you, cause like when you think about like outside of science, there's either, there's like kind of the echo chambers online of like, like I'm certain of this position, I'm certain of this position. And like, that's not productive. The other extreme though is like, I'm like, I think this is true. You think this is true. And then therefore like, and like some people are producing misinformation and they're like the, the waters have been muddied. And so therefore people just kind of like throw their hands up in this almost like, like kind of parody of skepticism of like, okay, I can't be certain of anything. Therefore I'm just gonna like tune out. That's also not good. And I think right. like, like the happy medium of like the scientific skepticism, I think is really good where it's like, and so there was um, a, uh, a professor of mine told me this story 
um, that he he was teaching he was teaching this class and like he came in and gave a lecture on Tuesday and then like the next day he read a paper that actually like invalidated what he had taught and so he came in like he went to the class the next day on Thursday and he and he um, and he told his class he's like like what I told you was wrong like, on Tuesday and if that bothers you you need to get out of science like like the fact that like we actually like want to reward and want to like revel in the fact that we're constantly learning more and getting closer to the truth. But, but I think at the same time though, like therefore then we shouldn't like go to this like other skeptic extreme. We have to recognize what um, so I, I, Isaac Asimov, he wrote this, he was, someone had emailed, or not, not emailed, someone had written a letter to him um, about like, oh, like people used to think the earth was flat. They were wrong. People used to think the earth was a perfect sphere. They were wrong. So like, therefore, how can we know anything? He's like, he's like, if you think that thinking the earth is flat is just as wrong as thinking the earth is a perfect sphere, he's like, then your view is wronger than both of them put together. And so like, we have to realize like, yes, things are wrong, but we're kind of asymptotically approaching the truth. And so I think there's like having a certain skepticism, a certain amount of uncertainty, but recognizing that we are getting closer to the truth and that we can get closer to the truth. I think that kind of scientific perspective, um, in, in the best case, I and mean, there's many scientists who are like, they might speak very lawfully about that, but like when it comes to their own research, they'll like fight tooth and nail to like make sure no one like, like overturns their own, their own pet project. Um, but I think that idea of like recognizing that this endeavor is kind of asymptotically approaching better and better understanding of the world, even though at any one point, yeah, like things are in draft form and like, and that's okay. But therefore that doesn't mean that therefore nothing is knowable and we should like throw everything out or kind of throw our hands up in despair. Like, like we have, like, and I think that kind of approach towards what we know and what we don't know, like if we can teach that, like, or kind of export that from science to the rest of the world, I think that could be enormously powerful. I love it. And, and, you know, I was involved in the citizen science movement for a long time and kind of the popular, the popular story that emerging is like, look, we're getting all these people to participate. We're collecting all this data, you know, fold it and, and galaxy zoo and, and eBird. And it's amazing. But I thought the real story was, wow, look at the effective way that these groups are communicating, not just the outcomes of science, but the process of science. And to me, that was the main story. And um, I think that's kind of what I'm hearing from you is how do we not just communicate the results of science? How do we communicate and invite people yeah. to be a part of the process? Right, I agree. Um, I, I, we, yeah, when we, when we promote like the results of science at like the expense of like the fact that like science is a process, it's not just a whole, it's, like, it's, not, it's not textbooks sitting on a shelf. Like that's not science. That's like, that's the results of science. Science is a process and like, and like teaching people how to use that process and like how to really how it how we understand it like saying like guess what like scientists are human they have rivalries they think about these things they get ideas in the shower they they kind of work backwards in certain ways like like the whole like scientific method that's being like, like that's taught in school like I and mean, yeah that makes sense but like it's a lot more um happenstance and like messier like the way science works and like we should we should teach that we should revel in it like it's amazing like the fact that like all of that works is <laughs> phenomenal Mm -hmm. Here, here. Well, I, I normally end uh, with the question of uh, what what is your your best idea to make science better, but I think that's a pretty good one. Do you do you have any anything else you want to add, or do you or do you want to leave? I'm that very as happy with that. One. I, I would say the I mean, the other idea, I mean, and we we've already discussed this, but I'll kind of just reiterate it is like I think that like we need like we need more organizational innovation and like more like more experimentation with new types of scientific organizations because I think. Yeah, the, the more types of structures there are, the, the different types of incentives and the, the different ways that people will be able to participate in science. And I think that like the more the merrier and the better it will be. Well, I, I like that too. Uh, Sam, thanks Thank so you. much. Uh, and and I, I'll keep following along with all of your newsletters, the Lux newsletter, your own newsletter. Um, and I can't wait to, to see what you do next. Sounds so, great. Thanks so much. Thanks for, thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you.